Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It's Tuesday, the 8th of May, 2012, and our special guest is Keith Devlin. Keith, welcome. Hi, Steve. Thanks for inviting me. I'm so delighted that you're here. <laughs> Cannot wait to talk. <laughs> the Future of Education is a Web 2.0 Labs project. Come visit us at web20labs.com. Thanks to Blackboard Collaborate for providing this terrific space. It is the fifth anniversary of Classroom 2.0. There's a lot of fun going on. In addition to the crowdsourced book project for which we've received and are overwhelmed by 130 chapter submissions, uh, we have the Ed Incubator program helping small startups, passion projects, uh, find teachers to actually talk to about what they're doing. Uh, both the book project and Ed Incubator can be found on classroom20.com as well as 66,000 other educators. Hopefully you've found something there that's valuable to you. If you're going to the ISTE conference, which is at the end of June. Uh, we sure hope to see you. We do a number of crowd activities there, sort of, sort of under the radar crowdsourced activities that start on Saturday, the Saturday before ISTE. It's called Social Ed Con. It used to be called EduBlogger Con. I actually think this is the sixth year of EduBlogger Con, if we count that first year. Uh, we typically have about 250 social media interested educators who gather for an all day chance to have conversations with each other. For many, it's the best thing that happens during the whole conference. It is free. You're welcome to join us. Even if you're not registered for ISTE, you still can attend. We have a Global Education Summit, which is a three hour mini version on conference that will that is new, that will take place on Sunday. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we have the Bloggers Cafe and ISTE Live. Lots of fun. Go to isteunplugged.com to get more details. Our Social Learning Summit did take place on Saturday, April 21st. All of the record, 73 recordings, I think, all on social media and education. Uh, thanks to Discovery Education, who sponsored the conference. Uh, it is at sociallearningsummit.com or go to Classroom 2.0 and click on the link. Our Library 2.0 Future of Libraries conference is sponsored by San Jose State University. It's coming up in October. Typically 100 to 200 sessions over the course of two and a half days. Also free, also a blast. Library20.com or library2012.com. And then, of course, the Global Education Conference, five days, 24 hours a day, four to 500 sessions, November 12th to 16th, globaleducationconference.com. Oh, and as Keith will, will find interesting, we do have tentative plans for gaming and education conference, virtual conference, which should be a lot of fun. Coming up on the Future of Education next week, Mark Bauerlein talks to us about his new book, The Digital Divide. It's actually a collection of essays uh, by those for, against, and neutral on the impact of the internet in our lives. John Idelson talks about learning in ePortfolios. Elizabeth Merritt on the 24th talks about the future of museums. Special guest Brian Alexander comes on the 29th. Khalid Smith on Startup Weekend EDU on the 31st. Lots more there. New on this list, uh, Elliot Washer from Big Picture Learning comes on July 17th to round out the interview we had with um, Dennis Litke. And David Dubeldice, Dubeldice on social networking for professional development. He runs the EFL Classroom 2.0 social network. I think about 25,000 members. We're going we're gonna to share stories about managing large social networks for educators. If you've missed any of the shows, they are all recorded in full collaborate versions and in MP3. Buffy Hamilton and Kristen Fonticiaro came on last week to talk to us about the future of libraries and their crowdsourced book. Larry Johnson gave us a, a re first report on the New Horizon report results. Richie Norton talked about resumes being dead. Julie Lindsay and Vicki Davis showed us how to flatten classrooms. Anyway, lots of fun. Hopefully something there that you will find valuable. Okay, now is the time we give you a chance to indicate where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map for the star the second icon down. You're going to click on that twice, and then you're going to click on the map. And feel free to post in the chat where you're participating from, the time or the temperature. A gorgeous spring day in Park City, Utah. Well, we have our lone international guests from Canada and New Zealand. But you are appreciated.
Now I need a volunteer. I have set up a Mighty Bell curation space for tonight's conference. I included links to different projects that Keith has going. Is there anybody in the room who's been in the new version of Mighty Bell who'd be willing to let me invite them into that room and I'll invite others in? If you are in that category, would you raise your hand? If we don't... Oh, Rick. Good. Okay, so what I need is an email address. And I'll invite the three of you in while we're still looking at the map. Let's put that email address in the chat if you would. Like Rick, I've got your email. Peggy, I don't. If you're willing to do it, I, I don't have your email at hand, and don't want to make, don't want to mess it up. So please feel free to put it in the chat, or anyone else. Okay, I'm inviting Rick for sure. Okay, so this is what the room looks like. It's you can you can place in links to websites, files text and then there is a conversation, sort of conversation around each item. It's kind of a curation and conversation piece. It's very good for uh, this kind of an activity. So if you would like an invitation to this room, please go ahead and put your email address in the chat and Rick will invite you in once he gets his invitation. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring Peggy in as well. <laughs> And I'll, Sherry, I'm going to bring you in. And I'm going to stop there and let Rick finish it off. Thank you so much, Rick. Most appreciated. And Rick, you can actually pull that. All of you, if you would like, you can click on the top of the chat box. Double click on it and pull it out and make it larger and um, pull it up and down so that it's uh, easier to read, which we often recommend when you're on the show. Okay, well, this is really fun. I'm really delighted to have all of you here. Really thrilled to have Keith with us. Keith, uh, just loved getting, like I said before, loved getting to mm -hmm. know you vicariously through, through your material on the web. I don't think I've, honestly don't know that I've ever met anybody as prolific and such a variety of topics. I'm sure there are others, but I'm not sure that oh, I know them personally. Yeah. Yes. Do you, do you uh, sleep? Bit, yeah, but I, I don't know. I, mean, I just do what I do. <laughs> well, you, you do quite a good job of it. Yeah. So you are the math guy at NPR. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, it was right. really fun to listen to that. Mm -hmm. I'm actually going to put the link up here for people so they can see this page if they want to go to it. And I enjoyed listening uh, to a few of those sessions. Yeah, they're fun to do. I'm sure they are. Yeah, and I'm going to yeah. put the I'm going to put the link into the chat so people can see it as well. Um, you also are mm -hmm. uh, the author of about a thousand books. Am I right? Uh, thirty-one, actually thirty-two, but thirty-two is finished but hasn't been published yet. So. So with the math one, the game, math and games one, is that the one that hasn't been published, or is that one published? No, that's that's published. That was published about a year ago. Yeah, okay, there was actually, yeah, there were three books came out last year, but it was just accidental. They were all written at different times over different periods, and they all hit the hit the hit the bookstores at the same time. Uh, I had to laugh because I'm not even sure I understood some of the titles of your books. Uh, those are some of the earlier ones. I, I, I began at the top of the pyramid writing research monographs for the half a dozen people in the world that would uh, be interested in the research I was doing. Then as my career uh, progressed, I started moving down the pyramid writing uh, for broader and broader audiences. And uh, now I try to hit uh, uh, as many people as I can. OK. And um, just for fun, tell us mm -hmm. what Pildra Devlini is. Oh, that was really neat. Um, many years ago, I was the Dean of Science over at St. Mary's College of California in Moraga, California. And I, uh, one of our researchers um, was doing uh, some research in, 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 uh, in Antarctica looking for, he's an anthropologist, and uh, he had his, his NSF funding sort of run out, or he was in process of getting new NSF funding. 
and I found some funds in the college that I was able to keep his research going. And uh, on his next trip to, to Antarctica, he found this, um, this, 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 re this relic or whatever you call it, this fossil remains of this hitherto unknown, uh, whatever it is, a sort of a ringtail possum sort of creature. And he, um, since he found it, a part of the, the, the idea is if you find something in science, if you're an anthropologist, you get to name it. And so he named it in honor of me for keeping his research alive uh, at a crucial period. So uh, I was rather touched to have a, a ringtail possum named after me. So Keith, in your bio, you talk about uh, that yeah. your current research is focused on the use of different media to teach and communicate mathematics to diverse audiences. Correct. What yeah. do you mean by the word diverse? Um, pretty well, anybody is fair game. I uh, I sort of drifted into this way back in when I was living in England in the in the eighties when I started writing a column for the for the, for the Guardian newspaper. And I, uh, that led on to me doing work for the BBC radio and TV, uh, giving popular talks. Actually, if you look at, um, at popular mathematics books, most of them are written by Brits. There seems to be a, a trend in England, if you're a mathematician, to write popular books. There's me, there's, there's Ian Stewart, there's Marcus de Sautoy, there's a few other people like myself, uh, Isaac, uh, John Barrow, and so forth. And so uh, I've always had this, uh, this, this urge to sort of uh, explain uh, things to a broader audience, and uh, you know, having gone through various the, the classical media, newspapers, magazines, uh, radio, and TV, uh, then when when video games began to get popular, uh, I, I, I sort of moved into the video game area, and so when these uh, when these free online courses, these MLOCs, these MOOCs came on, well, I mean, they've been going for four or five years, but when they when they sort of became mainstream about a half year ago, I thought I've got to give that a try too. It's just uh, it's just a way of reaching a different audience and uh, try to spread the word as as broadly as possible. So part of the goal of the interview is to introduce you to the particular sort of classroom 2.0 future of education mm -hmm. audience, but yep. also to dive into some of these topics. Yep. So before we dive in, uh, I'm interested in having you give a quick quick description. First of H star. H star, so that stands for Human Sciences and Technologies Advanced Research. I co founded that with a couple of colleagues about 2005, and it was a way of uh, Stanford has got, this, has got this incredible record of collaborating with other universities, with governments, with industry. And back in 2001, together with a colleague, I created a thing called Media X, which was to make more efficient Stanford's collaboration with industry in the areas of uh, interactive technologies. Uh, that's my co-founder on the image there, Byron Reeves. And it was to take what Stanford had been doing since the 50s, which is collaborating actively with industry, and just be more efficient about doing it in areas that involve both the human sciences and, and industry and engineering. And then uh, that began in 2001. It was successful. And then we had lots of inquiries from, from university academics around the world to get involved with us. And MediaX was set up to work with industry. It wasn't set up to work with, uh, uh, with other universities and with government labs. So we created H-Star to do the same kind of thing, but to focus its interests on collaborating with, uh, with other academics around the world and with, uh, with government researchers around the world. And it's just, uh, it, it's a satellite, it's, it's really a, 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 what I call it, it's a virtual enterprise on the campus. We have a small suite of offices. I'm sitting in one of them right now, actually. Uh, we have a small staff. But really, we act as a sort of catalyst organization across the campus. We do a little bit of angel funding, angel investments in academic projects on the campus. Uh, we invest sometimes thirty to $50,000 in startup projects. But it's really about starting interdisciplinary collaborations, sustaining them for the first year, and then in, in the best Silicon Valley tradition, if, if a year's start doesn't help you to get off the ground, then we don't support you anymore. So we, we, we get things going, and then we leave it to the individuals to pursue the research and get funding from other sources and to, and to organize themselves. But it's a, it's a startup organization, an academic equivalent of uh, a sort of venture capitalists and angel investors, if you like. And, and what is the Center for the Study of Language and Information? 
That's and in fact the image you've got. I'm actually sitting in the building that you're now looking at. That's uh, uh, that's Cordova Hall, where we're based. And uh, Centre for the Study of Language and Information was set up in let me think, it was 1983, with money essentially from the Rand Corporation. And that was cutting edge back then. That was in, in the days when people were beginning to let computers talk to each other. And uh, the, the technology was racing ahead. Computers were communicating with each other. And uh, it was realized that there was no science behind with the technology. So CSLI was set up to study what happened, well, to study how, how symbol systems, how signals can carry information. Um, there's a whole theory of information goes back to Shannon and Weaver. But that really just looks at channel capacity and how much information can you send down a pipe. We were looking at what kinds of information gets sent down that pipe. Uh, CSLI was created in 1983. I came out there in 1985 uh, for a first visit because my research was in that area. Um, then came out full time in 1987 and have been floating around this place ever since because for my interests in uh, in communication, using mathematics to look at communication and human interactions, which is an interest I developed in the 80s. CSLI was the ideal place for me uh, to come. And so I was, uh, I was here for a, week, for a period. I then became the executive director of CSLI in 2000 when they brought me back here. And it was from the CSLI platform that we created MediaX and then HSTAR, which have a broader research mission than CSLI does. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Okay, so uh, fascinating. Yeah. Lots of uh, uh, books, lots of articles, roles that you play. Now I want to drill down on the topics for tonight's show, and let's start yeah. with math. Mm -hmm. So, what are we doing wrong when we when we are teaching math now? <laughs> um, to be fair, it's actually very difficult to uh, to do mathematics. First of all, there are two perspectives on mathematics, and they are both valid. There's what I would call the the mathematicians and scientists perspective, and then there's the engineers and technologists perspective. This is, there's many people, and, and and this is reflected in what you see coming out of Silicon Valley a lot. For many people, mathematics is a toolbox. They're very useful tools to use in in designing systems, in device designing technologies. Um, and so to that group of people, mathematics is a toolbox. It's a set of procedures for solving problems. And uh, you take the tools out of the box. You maybe adjust them slightly, and you let them run. Um, that's one perspective on mathematics. There's another perspective on mathematics, which is that uh, it is the, the language of science. As, Gale, as Galileo said, it's the language in which the universe is written. It's the language you need to adopt to understand the universe. And to the scientist, and to the mathematician in particular, Mathematics is a way of thinking. It's a, it's a conceptual framework. Uh, it, it's a science. It's a cohesive body of knowledge. Um, but the, 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 if I had to drill down onto those two perspectives, one is procedural, procedures for solving problems. It's a toolbox. The other one is a way of thinking. And in fact, both of those are necessary because very often when people start to do an engineering project, the toolbox doesn't have enough tools to solve them. You have to rethink and design new tools. So another way of looking at the difference is that um, let's compare mathematics with automotive engineering. The procedural perspective of mathematics, which is the one we tend to adopt in the high schools, in the, in the K-12 system, is like learning to drive the car. If you can drive the car, then for most people, that's, that's enough. Most of us are happy if we can drive the car well. And, and that's the K through 12 perspective on mathematics. It's the engineers and technologists perspective by and large. But there's another perspective. There are the people who want to lift the hood, see what makes the car work, fix it if it goes wrong, and design new cars. Well, those are the people who want to go beyond the procedural view. Uh, people like myself want to lift up the hood. What makes mathematics work? Where does it come from? How can we change it? How can we develop new mathematics? How can we understand it and fix it when things go wrong? You clearly need both kinds of people in, this, in the automotive industry. Every one of us needs to drive, and yet we couldn't drive cars safely if it wasn't for the people who designed cars, improved them, make them safer, and make them better. And the same is true in mathematics. You need people, a lot of people need to use it, but they're not mathematicians, they're users of mathematics. And there are people like myself who not only want to use it, 
but we want to build it, develop it, and understand it. And those two perspectives are both valid. It's fine at the K-12 system to focus on procedures because lots of people know want, need to use those procedures. But when you get to the college level, we tend to broaden the perspective and say, look, you reach college, you've shown that you can do the mathematics to get to college. Now let's understand what you were doing. Let's try to make you more sophisticated users. Now, so far, I've described them as if they're completely separate bins, but actually they're not. Because anyone who reaches the stage of understanding mathematics as a way of thinking can acquire new procedures in mathematics in a weekend. It's really easy for someone like me, because I've spent a lot of time understanding the subject, to learn a new bunch of tricks if I need to. Someone who's only learned procedures will find it difficult and challenging to learn a new procedure. So there's a, there is, in fact, an advantage to trying to get as many people as possible to be able to lift the hood of mathematics and understand what makes it tick, because that actually makes them much better users of the procedures. You know, a driver is actually a safer, better driver if he or she actually does know how an automobile works and, and, and to know how the gears work and so forth. You're just a better driver for knowing what goes on under the hood to, to a degree. And people who use mathematics as tools are actually safer, better users if they understand something about mathematics itself. So even though I describe those as separate perspectives, it's the goal of most of us in mathematics education, certainly at the high level, to cover both perspectives, uh, and in particular to cover the, the thinking perspective, because that, in, in the United States, for a country like the US, whose future and economy depends upon innovation and staying ahead of the innovation curve, being good at procedures isn't good anymore. That's 19th century. So, you know, the, the, teaching people procedures is a 19th century approach, and it was really good in 19th century society. In the US, we want people who, like Sergey Bring and Larry Page, can look at a problem of search and say, search depends on solving a mathematical problem that people haven't really thought about before. They took a search problem, turned it into a mathematics problem in an innovative way, and gave us Google. That's the kind of thinking we need in this country. And you don't get that by just focusing on procedures. You have to learn to think mathematically. So for the US, it actually now is critical that we teach as many people as possible to think mathematics and, and, and shift the focus from the procedures to the thinking, to the lifting the hood, and developing new automobiles. Because the US is going to have to develop new mathematical equivalents of new automobiles, because that's where our future lies. So I'm going to push you a little on this, okay. because I, I spent much of my day reading Keith Devlin, <laughs> and it feels to me like you. you also make a distinction in terms of that procedural driving instruction, uh, that in fact, it's not just learning to drive, that there's a difference between lecturing instruction and teaching. And that a lot of what oh, we yeah. do in the teaching yeah. to drive portion of mathematics is just not good teaching. Yeah, it, it's the old story of you know if you if you if you teach a person if you give a person some fish you'll keep them alive for a couple of days. If you teach them how to fish, they can keep themselves alive for the rest of their lives. Teaching people procedures, you know, it's a short-term solution. They can use those procedures, but what we really want are people who can think for themselves. Uh, can take a procedure off the shelf, tweak it, change it. If nothing works, develop a new procedure. Uh, we're that kind of a country. That's where our future lies. We, the real, and I wrote, a, I wrote a piece in the Huffington, Huffington Post about this a month ago. Um, procedural mathematics can be outsourced over an Ethernet cable in an instant. If, if, I want to, if I have an equation that I want solved, I can get that equation solved overnight by just shipping it off to, to, a, to a large outsourcing company in India or Russia or China. That can be done now. Uh, it tends to be done mostly um, with technology, with computer programs, but a lot of those embed mathematics. Mathematics, procedural mathematics, is outsourceable, and it's cheaply outsourceable, and it's quickly outsourceable. The only thing that's of value to the US is that ability in human minds to be able to think about a problem originally and come up with an original solution. And so what we should be doing is developing original thinkers and not focusing so much on the procedures. Yeah, you need to know a bunch of procedures to be able to leverage the, the original thinking. You can't, you know, you can't go out and do something on an empty stomach. You need to fill the tank first. 
But the focus of education in this country, the, the, the goal, should be developing original mathematical thinkers because the procedural stuff is outsourceable cheaply. You know, the, the, the reality is everything, when I graduated with, with, with a degree and then a PhD in mathematics, I had incredibly marketable skills. I could solve equations like, like, like nobody's business. And it was for many, for many years I had a set of marketable skills. Everything I learned at college in terms of doing mathematics can now be done much more cheaply than paying someone like me to do it in the United States, except for one thing. I learned how to learn new mathematics. That's the difficult thing that, 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 that we, we, we have a, still have a good edge on in this country. But the rest is outsourceable. So I'm, I'm leading us in the direction of talking about video games, particularly mm -hmm. with regard to math. Now, mm -hmm. if I'm learning to drive or I'm learning to play tennis, there is some instructional portion, there's experimentation, there's feedback, and there's a kind of a cycle of uh, learning and doing. Is that missing as well in, in the procedural? Uh, if it's purely procedural and instruction, the answer is yes. Showing people how to do something uh, is just, you know, it's giving them fish. And it keeps them alive for a day, but it's not developing the ability for the fish for themselves. And the only way to learn to fish is to actually go out and develop the skill of doing it. Um, we learn very, I mean, human beings through, through natural selection, the, we, we learn from experiences. In fact, if we have an experience, we cannot help but learn from it. So experiential learning is lasting, it's powerful, and it goes deep. Um, we learn by experience when we learn to drive a car, when we learn to, actually, even when we learn to walk, we learn by practicing walking. We don't take lessons in, 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 stand, in walking on two feet. We don't sit in a class to learn how to drive a car, to play golf, to ski, to do all of these activities. Um, we learn by doing them. Sometimes it's too dangerous, so we learn in a simulator. We learn how to fly planes in simulators. Some people learn to play golf in simulators. We can learn lots of things in, in simulators. The Wii is a great simulator technology now, uh, and, and, and the Connects in particular give us simulation capabilities for learning things. And video games are just various kinds of simulators. When we interact with a video game, we're experiencing something. It's part of our life for a period of time. And, and, you know, and every video game is a learning tool. I mean, all video games do is they teach you something, and then they instantly test you, and then they set you on this cycle of, of, of new information, new challenge, test you. New information, new challenge, test you. And you go round and round this, this learning cycle. And, and because of evolution, we get a high. We get, a, we get these little dopamine squirts into our brain when we solve a problem that was just outside of our reach a few minutes ago. So we, natural selection set us up not only to learn from experience, but to like learning from experience. We get a minor high when we solve a problem that we've learned from experience. The trick then would be to build simulators for learning mathematics. It turns out, and I've spent four or five years working on this now, building those simulators to learn mathematics is actually pretty darn difficult. Uh, mathematics is, is, is one of the most difficult things to embed in a video game, which is kind of paradoxical, because video games are built on mathematics, you know, behind Behind most of those video games is a numerical matrix and a randomizer doing stuff out of sight. But uh, taking mathematics and building good interactive experiences in a video game setting is extremely difficult. It's paradoxical. When I went into this, I thought, this is going to be relatively straightforward because uh, video games look tailor-made for learning mathematics. And they are. But it's just not a three- or four-year project. It's a several decades project figuring out how to do it. I, after several years, I began to understand why it was taking so long. Um, but, uh, and, and the simple answer is it took five or 6,000 years between the dawn of mathematics and the mathematics we had today. Some of the smartest people on the planet or, or took 5,000 years to get us to our present stage of doing mathematics. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised if it takes us maybe several decades to get that mathematics from the printed page, and the printed page or the computer screen with, 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 with symbols on it is just a modern version of the clay tablet. Uh, mathematics today is stored, presented, and done in what is essentially 10,000-year-old technology of, of symbols on clay tablets. We went from clay, clay tablets to, to parchments, to slates, to blackboards, to whiteboards, to computer screens. But going to computers, to, to video games 
that's a different step because we, we, are trans, we are making the step from symbolic representations of mathematics to natural native representation of mathematics. The point about a video game is it can simulate an aspect of the world, but mathematics is abstracted from the world. So what we have to learn how to do is to take that natural abstraction from the world that we call mathematics and embed it and represent it in its native representation in, in, in a video game environment. Um, and that actually is challenging. It's doable, um, but we haven't been thinking about it for very long. And uh, it, it's you know what took many hundreds of years to develop on the parchment model is taking us decades to develop in the native embedding in a video game. But it, but it, it will come, and I've, I've seen enough evidence now to be very confident that it's on the way. So what's the difference between what you're describing and the typical game which gets you to a certain place and then asks you to solve a problem before you can keep going on? Oh, I, I hate those. I mean, I, uh, you think of the meta I mean, you know, kids are not stupid. If, if, first of all, they've got to say to themselves, you're telling me that mathematics is useful and important, and, uh, and, if it, and in, in my case, I'm telling them that it's fun to do. And yet you're then saying, this thing that's so fun and so useful has to be dressed up in a video game, it has to be chocolate coated, and you have to present it to me as an obstacle that gets in the way of something I like to do. Those things, I think, are just plain dangerous because they send completely the wrong message. They say, mathematics is dull, boring, and irrelevant, and you're trying to bribe me to do it by embedding it in a video game. That is a message that we should not be giving kids, and, and I think those games do a great disservice to mathematics, and I just wish they would go away. So you, you uh, indicated in one video that I watched that there's been a little bit of a sea change when you talk to educators with regard to their perception of the future of uh, video games and math. Yeah, and it's partly because of, uh, you know, we've seen the beginning of some games. I've, I've written in various columns in my Prof. Keith Devlin column. I've had a survey. ProfKeithDevlin.org uh, is a blog that I write. I've had, I'm up to episode six now of a series about video games. I talked about this in the book that I brought out last year. There are now a small number, maybe five or six games that have come out that are beginning to do it right. Uh, and, 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 and really take, treating a video game as the natural native representation of a lot of mathematics. And, and that is, those the games are beginning to get out, and people are beginning to see the, the, the potential in, in, in these games and see the potential in the environments. And, uh, and that's raising the bar. And, and, and as that bar gets raised, uh, I think we'll see more good video games coming out. And, uh, and, and, and people are beginning to sort of jump on board and say, yeah, there's, there's, something, uh, uh, there's something valuable here. Yeah, that, that, that's the service. That's Is there the a mathematical mind? Uh, yes, and we've all got one. <laughs> uh, I wrote a book back in 2000 called The Math Gene, which first of all was meant to say there is no such thing as the math gene. But, the, but mathematics is it's done by the human brain. We in, the, the capacity for doing mathematics is something that is in, our, is in the human genes. And if you look at the way natural selection works, uh, if that capacity is in the human brain, then it's, it's in almost every human brain because that's how mathematics works. That's how natural selection works. So uh, almost all people, there's about 3 or 4% that do have some definite uh, brain structure that makes, it, that makes makes mathematics almost impossible to learn. But sort of 96, 97% of the population has the capacity for mathematics. Um, it's, it's part of, of our genetic endowment. Um, and in, in that book, The Math Gene, I, I sort of did a, an evolutionary trace of, of how that got into the gene pool. Uh, mathematics is just a way of thinking that, that draws upon mental capacities we acquired over hundreds of thousands of years of evolution. Um, so the capacity for mathematics is there. The question is, do we manage to turn that capacity on and make use of it? It's like uh, you know, we're all born with the ability to walk, and some people develop that into the capacity to be able to run quite fast, and some people uh, get Olympic medals for running the 100 meters or the marathon. So there's a spectrum of ability for running, which everyone has, and we all can walk. Um, and I remember when I was growing up, I remember thinking that people who ran marathons 
with different kinds of people. You know, you run 26.2 miles. How could any ordinary person do that? But, you know, you get into the 60s and the running boom takes off, and then into the 70s and 80s, and sometime in the, in the whenever it was in the 80s or whatever, I started running marathons, and I found, no, I have functioning legs. If I train those legs, eventually I too can run a marathon. So it wasn't that marathon runners were different, it's just that they'd spent more time developing that walking capacity into a running capacity that could be used for 26.2 for miles. It's the same with mathematics. The brain has that capacity when we're born, and we know that from lots of research, even within a few days of birth, the human brain exhibits quite sophisticated mathematical capacities. So that, that's known. Um, when you look at young kids in school, uh, if you're trained to look for it, you'll realize kids, three, four, five years old, exhibit phenomenal mathematical capacity. Some people, for various reasons, get encouraged to develop it. They can develop it to the point they become competent or better, or some people become professional mathematicians. But the parallel between the person who's born with two functioning legs, who is on the spectrum, at the other end of which does the Olympic gold medal in the marathon, and likewise, people are born with a, with a functioning brain, they're on that same spectrum, the other end of which there's a person who wins a Fields medal in mathematics in their 20s. Uh, so it's, there is a mathematical brain, and pretty well all of us have got it. It's just a question of how much do you want to exercise it, uh, in, in, in an analogous way to how much do you want to exercise your legs uh, to become an Olympic marathon runner. So we sometimes hear that math uniquely requires more positive reinforcement than other subjects. Do you think that's true? Absolutely. And actually, the same is true of runners. And, and you know, the, why was it that lots of us were able to run marathons in the, uh, in the 80s? Look what we did. We entered things like the New York Marathon, where there are thousands of other people just like us. Because you know, when you get up to 21, 22 miles in a marathon, all you want to do is lie down. But if you're surrounded by lots of positive reinforcement, by people suffering like you who are desperate to finish, you find you can draw on, their, uh, on, on that crowd around you to finish the marathon. And, and so you know, very few of us went off and ran marathons on our own. We, we joined in and we joined clubs, we read magazines, because we needed, and we knew instinctively, we needed that reinforcement, uh, and, and we, we, we did it as a, as a, as a crowd activity. And it's the same with mathematics. If you don't give people reinforcement, encouragement, and help, it's going to be very unusual. The person who can actually develop their mathematical abilities without that reinforcement is a very rare person. Uh, and that's true of almost anything in life. We, uh, we get better by being re reinforced by others. It's, it's unusual to find someone who's totally self-motivated. OK, let's move on to MOOCs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish they'd thought of a better name for that one. We sort of stuck with it, I guess. Well, so you write that higher education as we know it has just ended. And yeah. you're calling this the age of the MOOC. What do you mean? What are the positives? And what should we be careful about? Um, well, notice that what I said. I said, as we know, it has just ended. I actually went on to say, I have no idea what's going to take its place. But it's clearly changing uh, in dramatic ways. It sort of. You know, things began to change, uh, you know, when Sal Khan mounted Khan Academy a few years. That clearly was going to change the K-12 through system. There was no way it could avoid changing the K-12 through system. And it was only a matter of time before those of us in higher education started to do something different. And the challenges are different and in many ways more difficult in higher education. But it was inevitable once we have uh, a, 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 an infrastructure that can deliver stuff free uh, in an interactive way, uh, but it's not free to somebody, but it, it's free to, to most users, then it was clearly going to change everything. You look at the, at the history of what universities were set up to do. For many thousands of years, universities were the only place to get the information at all, because books, manuscripts were handwritten. There were very few of them. The manuscripts were hand copied in the monasteries to which universities were attached. The only way someone could learn something like arithmetic or algebra back in the medieval times, was physically going to a university or a monastery where there were one of these books. So the universities were the sole repositories of information. Then along comes the printing press, and the information itself became almost free in a modern term. You know, the information wanted to be free, and it sort of became free. And the universities sort of had to do a quick adjustment. They weren't the sole repositories of the information. They became, if you like, the people who delivered the information. 
and they sort of help people read and, and, and they help them go through the books. And we get the, the, the sort of modern university, although it's, it was, it's kind of bizarre how that sort of went on because today, even in schools and universities today, a lot of the time that teachers spend in the classroom is standing at a board lecturing. Now, you know, arguably that didn't need to be done once the printing press came along. But it, there is a psychological aspect. A lot of people who find it uh, difficult motivating themselves to learn on the road with a textbook find that they can, for psychological and supporting and feedback reasons, learn when there's a person at the front of the classroom lecturing on it and talking about it. It's even better if that person asks questions and interacts. But even if that person simply delivers without making eye -time contact with the audience, there's still some extra, there's still something extra that's gained by having a person read it. And then along comes Sal Khan and various other people, and they take the lecturing part and they put that online. And so now there's almost no reason for a person to stand up in front of a class and, and deliver information because that can be found on YouTube and it can be done in a format where you can rewind it, you can slow it down, you can get the delivery at your own speed. And so given the amount of time where teachers and instructors at universities actually stand and stand up lecturing, that is now gone. I mean, there's really no need to do that anymore. Um, occasionally you do, because you need to tailor a talk to, to, the, to, to, to a class. But lecturing and instruction should now be given in response to a demand and a requirement from the particular class in a way that's tailored for them and done on the fly. Taking something that's in a textbook and presenting it, those days are gone. That's gone. And, and the reason I was very provocative in my opening sentence, and I admit that I've, I've written for newspapers for many years, I've worked for TV and radio, I know how to write a reasonable headline to get people's attention, so it was meant to be an attention grabber. But think how we fund university faculty. Most universities need to hire a certain number of faculty, and one of the factors that we put in when we bid for, 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 for funds to hire faculty is we say, we have this many students, they have to have this many courses, we need this many lecturers to give those courses. Well, that argument can still be made, but the mathematics has changed, because we can't say we need this many lecturers, people to give that many lectures, because those lectures can all be on YouTube. But in fact, with the MOOCs, you're going to have people at Stanford and Harvard and MIT and the, the leading universities putting these stellar professors online with their courses, it's going to be very tempting for almost every other college in the nation to say, that's the delivery mechanism. You can get the information from those, those guys with the Nobel Prizes if you want. Your faculty, our faculty at these other places, are going to be doing different things. Actually, what they're going to be doing is the kind of stuff that they really should be doing, which is interacting with the students, talking with them, and developing them. Because videos are, one, are unidirectional. You know, you've got something in a video, it's like reading a book. You're the receiver. It's a one-way flow. Learning takes place when human beings interact. And so putting lectures online frees up the instructor to do what instructors are, are the most valuable for, which is interacting with students, asking, answering questions, observing what they're doing, give them feedback. Uh, I think education is going to improve enormously by freeing up the time of the, of the faculty and the teachers. So you're at Stanford, so of course that puts you sort of right in the middle of uh, yeah. Udacity and Coursera. Yeah. I actually really loved the MIT Harvard announcement yeah. because it felt to me like with some humility they were saying, part of why we want to do this is to actually understand how to make this a good learning experience. Not yeah, that we're yeah. just assuming we can broadcast and, yeah. and we've all of a sudden benefited the world as a whole. We need to actually look at how do you create an environment for that kind of relationship teaching when you're doing this sort of massive online activity. Yeah, and, and in fact, the, you know, the technologies that led Stanford to doing this, they've, they've been developed over several years now with various projects, some with, with large NSF funding, there were actually projects to improve and look at learning within Stanford. The idea was developing flipped classrooms to look at the learning process. So there were research projects to develop platforms to look at the learning process, to collect data, to do data analytics of learning. So it was an internal project. 
And, uh, you know, it would have maybe stayed an internal project somewhat longer. But then, uh, you know, Sebastian Thrun had this, you know, inspired by Khan Academy, as he's, as he's announced, he said, I'll just throw open one of my courses. And because he had Peter Norby from Google, you get Stanford and Google names, you get a, a, a sexy subject like AI, and you get 160,000 people signing on. They, you know, they weren't expecting that. They were expecting a few tens of thousands to sign on. So uh, that was just a sort of a, a, a side issue to, to sort of test the waters, if you like. But the, the whole project that's led to Coursera, um, that was a Stanford project uh, run mainly in the computer science department, but also with the, with the School of Education, to look at education and to improve education. Because what we're about as a university is, uh, is, is providing education, doing research into, into subjects, and understanding, in the case of education, doing research into the educational and the learning process. And so uh, it's, you know, what gained the news was that, and this has been in Silicon Valley, as soon as, as, as Udacity and Coursera sort of broke free, you know, the VCs came in with millions of dollars, and that gets the newspaper attention. So uh, you know, it, the, the story that most people saw was of these spin-off companies. But like most spin-off companies, they were built on, on, on several years of, of, of intensive uh, academic research to try and understand what goes on when people learn. So I want to get to the VCs, and I want to get to good headline writing. <laughs> but before we do so, I want to give you a chance to talk about the course that you've developed, which is a transitioning course yeah. that you're offering for free that starts in the fall. Yeah, yeah. I, way back when I, in my early days teaching way back in England, I, uh, I guess this would be in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, when I was teaching in England, I... Uh, one of the things we discovered was that students coming out of high school with this incredible, you know, I, I, I taught at a fairly selective university in England, and we got these students who had really good high school leaving results in mathematics, which meant they were good at solving equations and solving math problems that was presented to them as math problems. But we presented them with this university mathematics, this thinking like a mathematician looking for original thinking, and they were unable to do it. So we realized back then that we needed some Extra, they needed extra help to transition them from high school procedural mathematics to university mathematics, which is about thinking outside the box. They had to go from, you know, at high school, we reward students for thinking inside the box. At university, we want students to think outside the box. And that's a difficult transition. So I was one of a small number of people who developed what were then pioneering courses in transition. Uh, typically, they were half a semester or half a quarter course, five or six weeks, sometimes seven or eight weeks. And uh, I wrote one of the first books, so, uh, the, the, sort of the, the textbook, if you like, in that kind of material. And we, we developed material and, and course materials and, and books and other things to, to help make that transition from following the rules to, 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 to developing rules for yourself. And so uh, that then grew into a cottage industry. Most universities and colleges uh, in, in the UK that I'm familiar with and certainly in the US have these transition courses because they, they need to help students make that transition. Uh, and, and often it's the best students. The, the students who became really good at school mathematics have the most difficult time because suddenly they don't know how to proceed. Uh, the, all of the tricks that they learned that did well at high school no longer work. So it's, it's psychologically different and, and, and difficult and they, and they need help and support. So these transition courses do that. Um, and, and everyone has them now. So, uh, but, but I haven't given one of those for many years because you know, I've been there, done that, I enjoyed it, and I moved on. Um, then suddenly we have the, these, these MOOCs coming along, and I think, wow, I mean, you know, I, 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 this is a new medium. Can I take what we learned how to do in a classroom and do it uh, on an online audience? And the challenges were phenomenal because it is about learning how to think for yourself. It's not something you can instruct people to do. The online medium is great for instruction, but to teach one of these or to help students learn transition material, that's about helping them to learn to think a different way. So in a sense, all bets were off in the online environment. And so as a researcher, someone who's interested in education, as a researcher, as a scientist, I couldn't resist this one. How can we use that medium with all of the affordances it has, and it has a load of affordances that you don't get in textbooks uh, or even that you don't get in a classroom, how can we use that medium to teach this challenging material? Um, 
so it was a huge challenge to me. It's, 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 I couldn't resist it, and I'm really looking forward to running this experiment. And it's going to be an experiment, uh, which means the course I give this fall, by most measures, is going to be a failure, because failure is the method by which we learn how to do new things. If there's one thing that makes Silicon Valley successful, is that we have learned how to fail. Um, everyone who's successful in the valley has failed many, many times. Not, not quite everybody. Instagram. Actually, even the Instagram people failed a few times before they got to Instagram. But um, failure is the way that we learn how to do new things. And so um, I'm setting myself up now to fail several years in a row and, and, and as I and other people learn how to use the, the, the MOOC formats and the platforms that have been developed to help people learn challenging stuff that requires feedback and interaction. So I'm laughing here because you wrote two blog posts about Silicon Valley. Yeah. The, the one in which you give this thoughtful description of failure and its value has yeah. zero comments. But the first one that was what yeah. Silicon Valley executives keep getting wrong about education had 57 comments. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, so yeah. what was the point you were trying to make, and, and and then why did you feel that you needed to kind of come back and and explain further? Well, in terms, I mean, actually picking up on things I've said earlier, by and large, Silicon Valley now is putting all of it. And Silicon Valley has a very interesting way of working. It basically is run many experiments, most of which are going to fail. There's a funding mechanism, there's an infrastructure. That's fine, um, and, and that's a good way of working. But most of that effort is being channeled into teaching 19th century skills. I mean, here we've got a 21st century environment, Silicon Valley, focusing its attention. And, and most of the things the Valley does are 21st century problems. But when it comes to education, they've got blinkers on. They're looking at 19th century education. The future doesn't lie in taking 19th century ideas of education and in embedding them in modern technology. No, we've got to look at the mathematical and the scientific challenges that the 21st century itself is throwing at us and use those, those approaches in order to, to, to advance us in that thing. So taking 19th century pedagogy and dressing that up in 21st century technology is an insane thing to do. The 19th century is gone. It was gone 100 years ago. Let's take that brilliance and that great, wonderful way of working that Silicon Valley has and, 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 and use it to address 21st century challenges of how do we develop people who can think for themselves, who can, who, can, who can meet a new problem and come up with new ideas, using that technology to teach old stuff how to solve equations. Come on. That's just, just not the right use for the technology. And there's this weird blinkers that they put on in the valley that just drives me crazy. Another thing I heard you say in those articles was, why aren't you actually working with real teachers to figure out how to iterate to the right solution? Yeah, you know, the point is that there's a, there's a strange disconnect here. The, the education researchers in the last 40 or 50 years have discovered an awful lot. Cognitive science has advanced. Uh, we've been using AI to make some, 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 some analogies. We've learned a lot about how people learn, about what works, what doesn't work. There's a huge amount being learned now about the human mind and how we learn. And none of that is going through. They're basically taking a 19th century classroom and trying to sort of bring that into the 21st century. That's not the approach. We need to bring in the people. And, and let's be honest, a lot of the problem is that much, almost everything that's been discovered in the universities and the research centers about education, not only has that not reached the Silicon Valley executives, and it's not their job to know that by and large, it hasn't reached most classroom teachers. You know, a few years ago, I wrote a blog innocently saying, you know, we've known since Piaget that multiplication is a very complicated operation and that trying to teach it as, as repeated addition has got downsides and should be avoided. And it turned out that millions of teachers had never heard of the fact that multiplication was more than repeated addition. It wasn't their fault. If anyone needs to be blamed, it's the people in the university education departments who have known this for years and haven't gone out and written blogs and, and, and written articles for newspapers and gone on TV and radio and talked about their discoveries. We know a lot about learning, and it really is the duty of those people who know that to go out there. I actually wrote another provocative column saying, basically, if you're an academic who studies research and you don't have a blog, you should be ashamed of yourself. 
because we need to be on the blogs, we need to be out with Twitter, we need to be on the radio, we need to be on TV, we need to be doing the kind of thing I'm doing now, and making sure that all of the stuff we know gets out there to the people who need it, which is the classroom teachers. If the teachers knew it, it would reach the Silicon Valley people who actually have a lot of expertise and a lot of money to do great things. And I just want them to use their, their know-how and their skills and their abilities. And I'm a great admirer of Silicon Valley technologists. They're incredible people. But they need to do it, use those, the, their skills to address 21st issue, century issues in a 21st century way. And that means working with teachers and experts. So Keith, I, I met you at a conference at Stanford. Yeah. And uh, one, one yep. of the moments that really has stayed in my mind, which isn't fair, but it stayed in my mind, was a, a faculty member who raised her hand and said, so where do you find these good education blocks? And which was a question maybe from five years ago. But, but yep. as soon yep. as we kind yep. of gave the answer, then her response was, well, maybe Stanford should create a list of the best blocks. And I wondered, is there a little bit of a danger for an institution like Stanford, especially with this, the New York article and the tie with uh, Silicon Valley yeah. and the sort of rush for money, is there a danger of myopia within a community like Stanford? Uh, there's certainly a possibility, that, and, and there could be myopia. I mean, just, 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 I, I could, much of the time in academia is spent focused on deep research questions. And so, you know, we are, we, universities were set up. Uh, and the tenure system was set up so that people could be freed of the, of the normal pressures of life to reflect and do research and to pursue studies and to really understand how things work. Now, Stanford is actually very unusual. Stanford and MIT in particular are unusual universities because we were set up as institutions not only to do that, but with a mission and a structure, an internal structure, that allows us to have outreach, to create startup companies, to talk to industry people more freely. And so... Uh, and because of our reputation, we can legitimise things. I mean, that, that, that idea of a list would be, you know, they, I mean, we're talking about MOOCs. Why have MOOCs? You know, MOOCs, was, they, they've been going for the last four or five years. I think the first one was in Canada, in University of Manitoba, I think it was, in about four or five years ago. MOOCs have been around for a while. They became a big news story when Stanford put a MOOC on. Um, that was made a, a big story, and then it became an even bigger story when MIT and then Harvard jumped on. So... The big universities do gather the news, they, they make these things happen, and suddenly everyone wants to do a MOOC. So universities like Stanford do have a lot of influence. We, 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 we create news and, 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 and we have a responsibility. Um, so I think we, it, it's wrong of us, you know, it's part of the way we work as a university to work quietly in, 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 in somewhat obscurity, but given that we have uh, this this high profile, and it was a deliberately created high profile. In, in the case of Stanford, that was developed in the in, in, in the Cold War period, uh, we have that high profile. I think that gives us a responsibility to actually do more outreach than anybody else, uh, and to actually say, "Hey guys, we know this stuff. Here it is. We're going to put it out. We're going to give some kind of endorsement uh, and, 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 and legitimise it, if you like. You know, bring it, make it mainstream." Keith, as a courtesy to our guests, we finish on time. So I, I really want to thank you for coming to the show. I'm hovering over the smiley face icon and using the applause button. It's really hard to find in this new version of Collaborate, but there was no way in an hour we were going to get through everything, but you, no. did, a, you did a yeoman's job. I mean, boy, we covered a lot of ground. We sure did, yeah. <laughs> Hey, I, uh, I'm, I want to recommend anybody, please, uh, feel free to go to File Save, and you can save the chat. It has all the links to the sites, and there are lots of them for Keith, M many uh, that are worth paying attention to. Oh, and I, look forward to I look forward to reading them. Yeah. Keith, thank you so much for coming on. Most appreciated. Coming up next okay. week, again, Mark Bauerlein on the Digital Divide, and then John Idelson on Learning Any Portfolios. Keith, you've been terrific. Thank you. Okay. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Take care. Thank you. Okay. So feel free to log off. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Most appreciated. Really a fun show. Sorry we didn't have time for Q&A, but I knew there was material we just had to get through and didn't want to miss it, and I appreciate your being patient with me.